I'm Drip Roy, a research scientist on the Google team, and I'm going to explain to you how we model our systems and the value we extract from simulation. I want to start by explaining why we model our systems. By having trust in our models, we can project how a certain improvement will impact our experiments. As an example, reducing measurement time will both reduce idling error and increase measurement error. And by trusting our models, we can simulate how that would perform and decide whether or not it's worthwhile. Modeling also allows us to ex estimate the value for out-of-model error parameters, which is important for both developing trust in our models and trust in our understanding of the system. Lastly, modeling allows us to create expectations for when critical performance goals will be met. In order to use our models, we have to have different simulations. So I'm going to run through them quickly here. On the left, I will have simulations that are fast to run, however, do not close closely match the system dynamics, whereas on the right, I will have more involved simulations, which are both slower and match the system better. To start, we have pally tracking simulations. These simulations involve a noiseless simulation of a Clifford circuit, followed by individual shots where poly errors are inserted and then propagated to the end of the circuit. These are very quick. However, they have a very narrow error um, set that you can look at with only poly errors. Second, we have Clifford simulations. These simulations are essentially the same as the first step of the polytracking simulation, repeated over and over again, where the errors are resampled after each shot. These are slightly slower than the polytracking simulation, allowing you to look at a slightly wider set of errors, all of the Clifford gates. Third, we have a type of simulation called, we call polyplus. This is an internal simulator we've developed, which allows you to do Clifford simulation while also including leakage. Leakage is a type of error where the qubit leaves the 0, 1 subspace and enters a higher excited state of the transponder. Understanding these errors is key for um, projecting our performance on quantum error correction experiments. Lastly, we have full quantum simulations. These are simulations where we store the entire quantum state and then apply full quantum channels. They're inefficient. However, they allow us to really accurately model our system. So they're essential for us proving that our models are matching the experiments correctly. If you're interested in these, tomorrow, Dvir Khafre will present more on them in a technical talk. Once we have our simulations, we want to build a model. In this slide, I'm going to show how we built the model to simulate our performance on an experiment we took in February of this year, when our logical error rate per cycle was 7.6%. In all of these simulations in this slide, we'll be using the full quantum simulator to fully understand our error models. We start with a base model, which has a logical error rate of 2%, which involves single qubit and CZ errors using T1 and T2 times pulled directly from the qubit frequencies. We then include crosstalk and leakage for the CZ gates, readout and reset error from the experiment, and the idle error, which is the error the data qubits see while the measure qubits are read out and reset, is purely from T1, T2, and a leakage heating rate. This first principles model dramatically underpredicts our logical error rate. To improve it, we look at the experiment and add things in. The first thing we add is extra depolarizing error to our single qubit error rates. On the right, I'm showing a CDF where the blue curve is the coherence limit for our qubits, for single qubit error rates. You can see that the orange curve, which is the actual experimental errors pulled from randomized benchmarking are far larger than the coherence limit project. This tells us there is some excess error present in the system. What we do is we add extra depolarizing error to our single qubit gates in order to match this randomized benchmarking experiment. This brings our error rate up to 3%. Next, we add extra depolarizing error to the CZ gates. Again, on the right, I'm presenting a CDF. Here, of the different components that build into our model for CZ error. In blue, we have the crosstalk. In orange, the decoherence. And in green, the control error. This leads to a predicted total that's shown in red. The purple curve is the experimental total we see in our experiments. And you can see that for most of the pairs, it exceeds the predicted amount. We again add extra depolarizing error in to bring these two curves together. And this leads to a logical error rate of 4.3%. Next, we look at the leakage rates. To do this, we look at an experiment we call leakage slicing, which involves essentially running our error correction experiment up to a certain depth, cutting it off, and then measuring this higher excited two state. On the left plot, 
we have a data qubit, shown in blue. You can see the leakage builds up monotonically over the course of multiple rounds, indicated by the gray dotted lines. On the right plot, we have a measure qubit, shown in green. You can see that here, the leakage is reset at the end of every round when the qubit undergoes reset. From these two plots, we can extract effective heating rates and update the leakage rates used in our experiment. This brings our logical error rate to 4.8%. Lastly, we add extra idle errors to our system. To do this, we look at PIJ, which has been briefly mentioned earlier and will be discussed in more detail tomorrow by Juan. PIJ is essentially a correlation matrix between the different detectors in our system. And so when two detectors fire in the same round, it indicates an error has occurred during the data qubit idle stage. We can look at these error rates and update the error rates in our system to add excess idle in. You can see this makes a large jump to our logical error rate, bringing it to 6.9%. Here, I'm plotting all of the different error models I've just discussed in blue, and the experiment shown in orange. You can see that our final model does match the experiment pretty closely. You can also see that the biggest jump was this last step from C to D, where we have added extra idle errors in. This is a great example of how modeling guided our research focus, as this extra idle error, and seeing that we had a lot of excess idle here, caused us to focus more on improving this through dynamic decoupling, as Kenny mentioned in the previous talk. Next, I want to look at our modeling for the experiment we're actually presenting in our paper. Here, I want to first look at the detection probability plots shown in the middle. You can see that detection probability, as Kevin mentioned earlier, is the probability that a given detector fires in a given round. You can see that the plot in blue, which is the experiment, closely matches the plot in yellow and green, which is the simulation. This gives us confidence that our error rates in our simulation are roughly on par. We now want to discuss the PIJ detection correlation matrix. In this matrix, we're looking at the correlation between the likelihood that given different detectors fire at this in the same run. And we've categorized these errors into three types, space-like, time-like, and diagonal. Space-like errors, shown in red, occur when an error happens before any of the stabilizers in a round are measured. This leads to two detectors in the same round going off, which are space-like separated. Time-like errors, shown in purple, occur when a measurement error has happened. In this case, an X error has occurred right before measurement, causing a stabilizer to flip in one round, and then flip again in the subsequent round. Lastly, we have diagonal errors, shown in blue. In the example, an X error has occurred after the second CZ in a circuit. This leads to the third CZ showing a detection in one round, and the second CZ showing a detection in the round afterwards. This is a diagonal edge. On the right, we have a bar chart, where we compared the likelihoods of all of these edge probabilities according to the experiment, the poly plus simulation, and the poly simulation. You can see that the poly plus simulation, which is in yellow, is pretty close to the experiment in blue while the poly simulation lags behind, likely because it does not include as many error models which cause most of the edges in our system. This gives us confidence that at the component level, our simulation, our poly simulation at least, is matching our experiment closely. We now want to move to the logical landscape. On the left, we have the data figure from the paper, with the solid lines being the actual fits of the experiment, and the dashed lines being the simulations. You can see that the distance 3 simulation matches a lot closer than the distance 5, which is because distance 3 codes are less sensitive to error probabilities than distance 5. So slight deviations are magnified. On the right, we have a contour plot made using a poly simulator. This simulation slightly unpredicts the logical error rate because there aren't as many error models in the system, but the broad features are correct. You can see that in this model, our current status, where E3 and E5 are roughly equivalent, happens at S of 1.17, which, given that the simulation was a poly simulator, we think is within model. This allows us to have some confidence that our experiments aren't being dominated by outliers and are actually measuring what we expect. But lastly, I want to show a counterexample to that, where an outlier has occurred in our system. In this data set, we are prototyping a new change in our system, and so the system was being tested when it wasn't in a great calibration state. However, we noticed that the distance 5 code dramatically outperformed all four distance 3 codes. Now, you would expect this to be exciting, as we would think this would be a crossing. However, this crossing does not match our model at all. It was happening at a logical error rate of around 5 or 
And if you look at the inset, you can see this crossing in red is dramatically over the crossover point, but does not match the general trend of the rest of the data points. We thought that because it doesn't match our model, something must have been up. And upon looking closer at the data, we see there was a dramatic phase error on the central qubit in the grid. This center qubit is very important, as it touches all four distance three codes. So if it goes wrong, it'll dramatically damage our crossover measurement. This is another good example of modeling allowing us to notice an outlier and explain strange data. With that, I want to thank you for your time and hope you enjoy the rest of QSS.